Uh, so it hasn't been as much of an effect. It may be interesting to see how that would affect, could affect other things in the future because this is where I'm gonna get really chemistry. Um, but Raman is looking at the bonds between the individual atoms um, are what affects the Raman. And so that is generally independent of particle size. So that's handy for when you're doing Raman analysis of things. Okay, thank you. Uh, I did cut off the, the last um, thread. Let me get to specific questions. And if you want to continue, then we can, um, we can move into breakout rooms shortly um, to, to um, continue with longer conversations on a single thread. Okay, I'm gonna return to um, chat. There was an earlier question about um, humidity of the paper, which um, I think would, would specifically speak to uh, Wan Jin's work. Um, however, Jennifer, um, if this is a component of what you do and what you've studied with humidity of paper and have some insight as well, um, please feel free to join in. Um, so um, can you speak to that and um, your discoveries, um, Wan Jin, with what you've been doing? I, I use a really, um, I guess, quite a common way of dampening paper that was taught to me by Kurosaki, which is um, dampening newsprint until it's kind of floppy and letting that sit for about 20 minutes to an hour and then adding your um, washi in and letting that sit for a while. Um, I don't think it's the most traditional technique, but it's um, a kind of foolproof way and it, you cover it with plastic sheet. And I didn't realize that you would actually get really, really regular damp paper, but you do um, from my measurements. So I was really thrilled with the fact that I thought this very kind of um, basic method would um, produce actually <laughs> results, but it doesn't, it's pretty good. So that's how, the only insight I have. Leave, how long did you leave the paper in the newsprint damp pack? Well, generally I leave it until it has, um, when you pick it up on a fingertip, it kind of has a gentle bend to it. So, you know, like if you have very thin paper, sometimes it goes floppy if you put too much water and so on. So there are other kind of aspects to tacit knowledge that maybe we already have with our sensitivity and the fact that one of the days I worked, we had a massive thunderstorm. So I knew it was a very humid day. So I didn't have to leave it so long because the paper was probably already damp to start out with. I think we all unconsciously adjust for our climate and our environment and, and the um, purity of the water from our water supply when we print and it does make a difference. But um, yeah, in general, I would dampen it until it had a kind of bend to it. So maybe an hour if it was thicker and 10 minutes if it was very thin paper. Since, since we do have um, two um, scientists with us today and, and many of um, many others of you who are scientists through your own work and humidity in papers is, is such a, um, an important question. I might suggest um, toward the end of our discussion and into the lunch hour, uh, I could set up a um, breakout room for those who would like to discuss um, humidity of paper in, in, in some um, technical sense. I'm looking out at others here who I know would have impact or excuse me, input. Um, but I'm going to go um, now to some other questions for those who've been patiently waiting. And Andrew, um, I think you should be able to um, unmute yourself and pose your question. Yeah, I'm very curious about the, the um, uh, uh, question about how to quantify tacit knowledge. Um, I think, you know, uh, if you make bread or pasta and you ask someone for a recipe of how much flour or water to add, the answer is almost always the right amount and you do it by feel. Um, and obviously in a damp environment, it's more flour and if the flour is already damp, it changes. And so one of the reasons you have so many variables often while you're printing that you have to adjust each one depending on the other one. So you don't really need an insometer to figure out how hard the dough is. You need to work with what you have at the time. So I'm curious, one is, are you better now at to reliably printing Go Missouri when you want to? Um, because when I have workshops, it almost never happens when I want to show it to my students, but it always happens in the workshop immediately by somebody else printing. And I can say, hey, look, this is exactly what I was trying to show you. Um, and uh, I guess that's it. Have you actually managed to um, 
create it exactly when you want it. And two, um, uh, uh, I was intrigued by the paper concept as well, because I tend to leave my paper overnight uh, and it's uniformly damp, but I never thought to measure the, the humidity. So I'm very intrigued by your experiments and how to quantify tacit knowledge. Uh, uh, I like to think of it as magic and we learn it by doing rather than um, having to study it to death. It's a brilliant observation, Andrew, and it's really true for a lot of things that we do, like how to sharpen a pencil or how to walk or how to how to water a plant. Um, and sometimes poetic language is more appropriate for a description of something very, very specific. And I got to the stage where I started thinking about onomatopoeia. So like the word nechi nechi, neba neba, nuru nuru, they're all the kind of words for stickiness and we have sticky and slimy and the continuation is something that we maybe wouldn't be able to quantify, but we would say if something was sticky rather than slimy or slippery. So that's kind of, you know, agreeing with you really that it's a, a fine art. Um, but in terms of, um, sorry, I've forgotten the beginning of your question. Beginning part, the beginning part was, uh, let's see, I'm not, I'm not muted. I guess it was now after you've done your experiments, can you oh, reliably yeah. create Go Missouri when you want to? Can I make it on demand? It's definitely less than 50% glue to water combo. Um, it's definitely with pressure less than five kilograms, although I'm not using a brilliant um, uh, translation of pressure and weight. Um, it's definitely with paper with humidity over 21%. So a little bit damper paper. And um, they probably, those three variables probably would make a good gomazuri. But I think it also depends on the wood and the wood grain. And I imagine this is what happens when you teach students. You have a beautiful, well-seasoned block with all the glue and ink sitting in it. So it's gorgeous and it's ready to print a very flat color. And then the students use their brand new wood. And of course, it's not had anything received into the fibers. So they're more likely to have relatively less glue. So I think it's, you know, that's also the trick of the, the situation. And you know about how when, you know, when it's very um, wet, you, tell, you often tell them to prime it, don't you? You kind of tell them to fill the block up with water and glue and then wait, go and have a cup of tea, come back, do it again, and then maybe start printing and you'll be okay. So I think we have sort of adapted to that, but I think, yeah, I could make a recipe for you maybe in the next month or so. <laughs> I'd send it over. Thank you. Well, uh, next, uh, why, uh, excuse me, you and me, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I think my question was similar to Andrew's. Um, and and I, I also really am very fascinated with this idea of tacit knowledge and trying to kind of quantify it. And I just have to make a comment on how I love the visual of you trying to balance the woodblock on that scale in your own fruit scale and trying to print. That was really amazing. Um, just the visual of it um, was just perfect. Um, but I, I'm also um, wondering what other tacit knowledge that you're, I mean, it's, it's such an interesting topic, especially with the, with the Mukwanga process, because when we all learn, it's always this, you know, from kind of the Western point of view, whenever we learn something, we always ask them, ask the teachers, like, what's the ratio, how much? And their answer is always, you know, just this much, you know, there's no, you know, tangible number or, or recipe or anything. So if there's any other um, other things that you're, you're going to be tackling. Um, so that's my question. And I also have one question for um, Jennifer as well, if that's okay. Um, I, I was that I, before you were, uh, before your presentation, I didn't really even think about the fact that they might actually be printing with different black sumi when it's all black. So that's really interesting to me, which kind of reminded me of this video that I watched a long time ago um, made by Adachi um, print shop where they just use regular sumi to do the outline, but then they print the hair 
with different um, darker sumi ink. So it, it made me recall that, that image. And I was just curious if there were some interviews or conversations that you might have had with the printers that may actually have the, the practice or the history of that process of printing the border diff with different sumi and the image with different sumi ink. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went into this sort of totally blind. Um, the For those that aren't familiar with our collection, um, I'm at the Freer Gallery of Art in Arthur M. Sackler Gallery. And when he started collecting, Charles Lang Freer actually sold off all of his Japanese woodblock prints so that he could afford more um, things that he felt were of higher quality. And so we actually have a very, um, not necessarily young in terms of when they were printed, but young in terms of when the museum started gathering woodblock prints. Um, only started happening in the mid 2000s, maybe maybe the early 2000s, but maybe mid 2000s is probably a better um, time period for that. And so there's a lot more knowledge of and focus on the paintings in our collection. And it's been well known by that calligraphers will choose different inks based on the effect they can get on paper when they're painting either calligraphy or the paintings, you know, using a brush. And I was very curious to know if this translated over into the woodblock prints. But when I was on um, my travels through Asia, I focused mainly on talking with the people who are making the sumi. Um, and I didn't have time to go and talk with anyone who's making woodblock prints. So that has not yet been an area that we've explored. Um, I'm very lucky that we now have um, a couple curators who are very interested in woodblock prints. And so it's maybe something we'll get to explore more at the museum. But so far, um, that isn't something I know from sort of um, the experts, more just something we've figured out maybe from the scientific results, which is kind of nice. It means they're pure, right? I have I didn't go in with an expectation one way or the other, but. I'd like to respond to um, Yunmi's question about tactic, tacit knowledge. I made another research project into sound because we use sound a lot when we print. And um, so I was thinking of capturing the sound, the very close, quiet, um, intimate sounds that are created between the brush and the block and the glue and the water and seeing if that was a useful mechanism to rely reliably um, um, aim for. I mean, we do it with um, oil-based yeah. relief ink. We talk about the sound of the sea. So I think yeah. maybe that's sound. So, that's perfect because that's also, I mean, I do lithography too, and that's, we talk about the sound of the brayer rolling on the inking slab and how different it is based on the tack, tack of the ink. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I, I, do, I do think there's a future in the performative aspects of um, print. I mean, this is not a new idea, but, but uh, ones you know what the you the your just the whole presence of of the video was not only informative but it was very pleasing to to watch and um, uh, some of you may recall from the uh, from IMC let's see 2014 at Geda in Tokyo um, um, Mikhail Schneider and um, uh, Mida the the professor. Um, at, uh, at Uni Tokyo University of the Arts did a um, spontaneous um, performance of art and, and music, of, of printing um, and music. And uh, I actually um, thought it would have been, had, had it uh, had the idea come around, it would have been wonderful to have done something virtually. Maybe we can get you and me, and we can get you to spontaneously, you and a couple of others out there to do that um, on the lunch hour. So don't go away. Um, two more questions, um, at least on our screen here. And we've got officially another 20 minutes for discussion. Um, so I'm going to go to those other questions and um, uh, I'd love to pose a couple as well. Um, but just to say, um, if you uh, don't need to run off um, during the lunch hour, um, I'll, I will, um, 
I can suggest some um, breakout rooms for topics or something like that um, to make the most of your time if you do want to follow up, or we can leave the open discussion going. Okay, um, Alexander, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Okay, my question is to Jennifer, because <laughs> we have two types of inks, like pine-based, um, soot-based, yes, and uh, lamb black-based. And the first one is matte, the second one is shiny. And I would like to clarify <clears throat> the shiny quality of the oil, I mean, lamp black based ink is connected to its uh, graphite like structure. Yes. I actually don't know exactly what I, when you talk with the ink makers, they attribute it to actually, especially in China where there's um, pig fat incorporated into the lamp black, um, they attribute the shininess to the pig fat. Um, and they say that the sort of, if there's a little bit more pig fat in the, in the fuel mixture, that that will make a shinier ink. Um, and it could be that, you know, Ideally to make soot, you're sort of, you're taking the molecule of the fat and breaking it up and then making it go back into forming the soot. But you can just as easily maybe have incomplete burning that would have some of those long um, chains from the oil present that I think would also make it shiny. I have not done the experiments yet to figure out if that's present in the sumi um, or not. Um, pine soot wouldn't have those same chemicals in it because it's made from, you know, burning the wood, which is cellulose and totally different structure. But I had never, until we got these results, I hadn't thought about it as being due to the graphite. And that's a really interesting question to take on board. I'll have to th think about that more when we do some of these follow-up experiments. All right. So that's complicated. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I was just curious because yeah, April. Yeah, it, there was a um, discussion about it. Uh, yeah, I had you. thought the shininess had to do with the Nikawa too. Doesn't that make it shiny? Yeah, but but you have, but in the pine based you have a Nikawa, yeah. In the soot <laughs> base you have Nikawa too. So it's uh, and the pine based ink is smart and different color, but but it's Okay, whatever. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, Pat, may we hear from you? Sure, I have a question. She's working. Okay. There she is. All right. I have a question for Juan Jean. And if I understand correctly, all of your experiments used glue. And did you have any experiments that just left the glue off and just had the color, the wood and the water to, to have that sesame seed effect? Oh yeah, definitely. If you have no glue at all, um, it generally makes a sesame seed effect unless you use a very strong baren, in which case you can, and you have a lot of pigments. If you put a lot of paint on, the paint itself has a binder in it, which if you put tons of pressure on, will make a very flat um, result. So, you know, my question is, can you get the effect more by leaving off the glue? Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. more guaranteed. Less glue, less pressure, and sure. also, yes, but April paste versus glue. I didn't have any noddy to hand, um, so I used this uh, conservator glue, but. Um, I've used wallpaper paste before, I've used rice starch before, but I didn't use a traditional noddy this time round. But uh, did you use methyl cellulose, I think? Yeah, methyl cellulose or hydrochloric cellulose. But there's glue. I, I, I wanted to differentiate between the glue that's part of the ink and the paste that that you're adding as you print ah uh, yes i think you're talking about the animal glue like the nikawa, the skin. nikawa in the oh, color yeah but you're adding a, like a rice paste or methyl cellulose 
while you're printing. Yeah, I mean, I did actually write a message to Seisendor asking them for their ingredients and they never got back to me. So I don't know if they're uh, still around. If anyone's in Nara right now, please let me know. And then I sent a message to Kuretake, which have a contact sheet saying, please, can you send me what you've put in your ink? Um, and oh, I didn't a secret, reply isn't it? from them either. But it would be super interesting to see what it looks like under the electron microscope because I don't know if you'll end up with uh, like bacteria particles or if we actually see, um, I don't know what we're going to see, like maybe rafts of carbon or something. But I'm just um, currently trying to work with the health department in the university. And um, we've figured out a way of um, slicing the paper so that we can have a look at it under much higher magnification and see where the pigment ends up. I mean, why not? Let's just see. And then I can tell you guys, and you would say, yeah, well, that was really useful <laughs> or not. <laughs> but just a silly, just taking the question to its natural conclusion. On, on that note, Wanjin, um, I, uh, I don't know if you um, know Henry Smith, the keynote speaker who, um, if you know him through in, uh, other auspices, but he has been very interested in the technical dimensions um, of print. And he has been working over the years with a couple of um, chemists and other re technical researchers on pigments and paper. So, you know, he might be somebody to, to, to tap if you want to expand that search. Um, uh, and actually um, on that subject, I'm just gonna make a quick note for all of you. Um, uh, if you didn't catch um, Henry Smith's keynote and also Matsui-san who spoke on Sumi afterwards at the opening, those, those recordings will be available. Um, but um, Henry um, has been working in the field for over 40 years and um, has been very generous um, with sharing um, his, his work. Uh, beyond an academic sphere. And he used to have a website where he had a lot of the PDFs loaded. And for some reason, it seems to be unhitched at the moment. So um, if any of you um, would like, uh, were interested in what he had to speak on and are interested in his, um, his, his he, he's a historian, but his, his work really expands into sociocultural areas and then also into um, technical areas. Um, I'm happy to send out a mass mailing with, with um, all of the PDFs for you to explore. So you can send, um, uh, oh, thank you for the, the keynote. Um, yeah, you get, feel free to send an email address and I'm happy to add that, add you to that list of um, sending out articles. Okay, um, next um, we have um, Judith or Judy. Um, you go ahead and pose your question. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, uh, you talked, uh, that, that's a question for Wu Wong. Yeah. Um, when, when I uh, use uh, uh, different colors, uh, I, I, I've always difficulty with using blue. And uh, so I think the, the colors uh, have also different uh, uh, reactions, maybe. So that's maybe uh, interesting also. I think, uh, yeah, people, uh, for example, Paul uh, Verno, uh, he, he used a lot of color I've seen. So he definitely know uh, this difference maybe with the different colors and, uh, and use of, um, yeah, I don't know how it's called, the, uh, where Ruun talked about, yeah, the Japanese uh, name. Gomasuri, yeah. Gomasuri. So what do you find difficult about the blue, Judith? Uh, I think the, uh, the blue is getting uh, 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 easily, uh, you get easily gomasuri, more easily than with reds and uh, yellow, I think. Yeah, that's my, my experience, but uh, I don't know. And, oh. and then if the, when you uh, use the same, same uh, paintings, the same inks, so... Yeah, I, I did. I did talk to a chemist a little bit about this, and I talked about how you know when you want a very beautiful, deep, rich color, you tend to print the same thing two or three times. And the chemist said it's because you set up a diffusion gradient in the paper, which allows the pigment to travel more happily into the paper body itself. So um, it's a combination of pressure and priming your substrate to allow it to receive what you're trying to give it. Um, so 
we talked a little bit about whether it's because the pigment is actually naturally hydrophobic, so it doesn't like water, so it tends to clump, and that the glue is a little bit like the effect of um, a surfactant, so something like um, maybe soap, a drop of soap would make the difference and make it sit smoothly, or whether the pigment, the glue is a, a way of um, giving it a body, a thickness, so it becomes a more, um, um, I don't know what you call it, like an even suspension. But she, I, I, I need to explore a little bit further. It's just the beginning of a conversation about exactly why it happens, but it hasn't been written down. And that's where I find that it's quite interesting. It's not, it's not been quantified. Obviously, it's not a life and death situation. So it's not been written anywhere. So um, I'm not sure. But I'm sure it's something to do with maybe the pigment size itself, particle size, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting to uh, research further. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Uh, to Wong Jin, just uh, just a thought about the pressure because I see at this conference I see that um, <clears throat> co comparing to my technique, everyone here is using very high pressure while printing, but what about much more softer touch? Because uh, I found out. That's just my thoughts about technique. That sometimes when you print black, uh, it's not connected to Komazuri, but very soft touch, like like uh, I don't know, his print or something like this, gives you the much better blacks than very high pressure. So I was just thought about it during your presentation. We, I, I remember Kurosaki saying, if you want to print black, you don't add any glue and you print it firmly first and then lightly the second time. So you imagine the, the um, paint is sinking into the paper and then sitting on the surface and maybe that duality gives the richness and makes the um, surface more um, solid, appear more solid. But that's just yeah. from memory. So. Yeah, I, I noticed that uh, the the lighter you print, the better blacks you have. It's always like this in my in my practice. But it's strange because you always want to print hard. You want to print very um, hard, but uh, you have to um, to force yourself to print very light, very light, much lighter than you think. That's just my thoughts. Not connected to Gomazuri, but to Black. We have, thank you, Alexander. We have five minutes remaining for official question and answer. Um, I'm going to um, ask Paul to pose his question and then Noel. And um, if the two, if um, you, Wanjin, and also Jennifer have a few more moments, I um, will, I would like to toss out a couple of more questions, but let's um, not to pressure you on time. Paul, go ahead. <clears throat> I have to find my voice. Um, one gene, the, uh, I wonder, because I think there are so many factors hinted at by Andrew, in fact, in, in the, the analogy with cooking uh, and how chefs arrive at a similar result in different ways and different mixtures. Um, one thing I thought was interesting, although you used the same paper throughout, I thought it was very important is how much size is in the paper. Uh, and that's quite important in terms of how, how the pigment will react and how the water will react. Um, I use this technique a lot in my own work, the, the combination of flat areas, areas with where the grain is visible, area, areas where it's kind of spotty and uh, different ranges of how dense or how few the spots are. Um, and I firmly believe that there's no formula exactly that, uh, that you will never ever arrive at an exact formula for that. There are too many factors. 
uh, again, Andrew hinted at this, it depends on the warmth in the studio, the humidity in the air, the, on that day, how much pressure you, you exert. Um, but what I'm aware of in my own practice is that on that day you do, if, if the gomazuri in that part of the print is very important, you do a bit of practicing and you get the feel, you get the feel for it. Does it need a bit more nori? Does it, is it a little bit more wa water? I mean, I've even seen Kurosaki sort of pick up the, a spray and, and, and spray almost in the middle of, of printing. Um, it's not a science in that way. I, I just don't think it is. Uh, um, uh, I think, the simple answers that you get from other printmakers, like where well, you need a bit more nori or you need a little bit less or a bit more water, those are the simple solutions. And, uh, but the key to it all is practice. Uh, I feel confident if someone uh, asked me to do Gomazuri, I could do it. But I would have to have perhaps on my own aside for a moment, a little practice of what's going on that day with the paper with the water, with the pigment. And earlier on, someone mentioned about the blues. There's definitely something with the blues. For example, uh, cerulean blue is, is naturally granulates. Is, I think it's to do with the size of the, the pigment. Um, but uh, I, I try, try also in my heart of hearts to wonder why you would want to formalize that exactly? Do you actually believe there would be then a solution of amount of pigment, amount of water or glue, and a, a bar in and a pressure that would arrive at the perfect gong Missouri? I don't want to break the pre the <laughs> the poetry and and the magic and the um, immense amount of tacit knowledge that you will hold in your fingertips I mean you Paul and um, Andrew and Michael you're amazing incredible artists so you know <laughs> don't want to capture this and take it away but what I do feel is important is that we ha don't have the language for it we're almost like blunted and we're unable to communicate and maybe there, if there was a way of communicating something in a very magical but intuitively correct way um, there's a sense of I, I don't want to lose this knowledge I feel sad that I, I lost the knowledge from Kurosaki I never videoed him you know I, I, there are a few videos online but he he's gone now and his his ability was incredible and I think it's a conversation about preservation because maybe this technique is something that uh, might be might have an incredible application in some other field, for example, um, you know, aerospace technology for coating um, surfaces with a speckledy pattern without having to try very hard. You know, there may be another application that's completely incredible medical application, and we know these things so well. We know how to do them in our bodies, and we're not very good at saying them. And maybe if we could be able to say them a little bit better, mm -hmm. who knows where that might lead. So that's my impetus. It's just that's a funny interesting. impetus. That's very interesting. And, uh, and the pursuit of, of, of knowledge is very interesting. But the, it's to, not to deny that that knowledge and that those types of knowledge is all about it building up the knowledge in your body, you, you accumulate that knowledge. It doesn't happen in a, in a few days or, or a week. It, it happens over time and a recognition of what works and what didn't work and why something didn't work takes, takes a passage of time. Uh, just like if you join the yoga class, you are the novice, you don't really know what you're doing and uh, some months later, you can go in the pose and do it without thinking about it. And I think that uh, the worst thing for me demonstrating Gomazuri is that I actually think about it in front of an audience. Otherwise, I would just do it naturally without even thinking. If that makes any sense. Anyway, thanks uh, for your... I love 
your top. I love that. You do. <laughs> Especially <laughs> like the balancing. <laughs> Just nuts. That's crazy. Well, I did also want to poke fun at this conference, the uh, formality, you know, it's deadly serious, but I, I know that actually we're just kind of in our living rooms, so it is quite a comical setup, really. <laughs> Tell me about it, although I'd still bring a baby to the conference if I had to. <laughs> Um, we've got one, one remaining formal question, if you don't mind my jumping in and giving um, Noelle um, a chance to um, raise her question. And then um, I know some of you um, have uh, work um, and other demands on your time. So um, Jennifer, for example, um, you know, I'm sure others have questions for you, but, but um, you're, you're still in your, your work hours. So feel free to um, exit and um, we can decide how we want to then use um, those who wish to stick around during the um, lunch hour, we can decide how best to use our time. I have some ideas and I'm sure you do as well. Okay, Noelle. Okay, let's see, can you unmute yourself? There you Sorry, talking to myself there. <laughs> it was a question for one. Uh, and I was just saying that um, I understand what Paul is saying. Uh, and that was a very valuable comment. But I still think that your experiments were very eloquent and beautiful in their own right and shows you what you can do with very simple and easily accessible equipment. I thought they were, they were really neat experiments. Uh, and I had a bit of a question. I, you didn't say much about the kinds of tech, or maybe you'd say a little bit about the kinds of textures you got, but I was wondering whether you can pair up, because I get, I managed to get Gomazura, not because I've wanted to, but because it's happened by accident. And I've noticed that sometimes I can get very blotchy Gomazuri, and sometimes I get more discrete dots. And I just wondered if you noticed any particular variable that gave rise to discrete dots or more blotches? Actually, I photographed everything and um, I put it into my paper and I don't know if we're sharing the papers at the end of the conference, but um, there's lots and lots of pictures there. So yeah, maybe yeah. I could just send it to you. Well, that would be um, wonderful. Yeah, I can send it to, I, I think I sent in the ones with not so many pictures, but I have it's quite long now. It's about 35 pages long. <laughs> Lots of pictures. So yeah, I, I think it's, as many people have commented, it's a combination of factors, including the brand of ink. And you can have, you can create gomazuri with um, glue if you have relatively less pressure, or you can create it with no glue, relatively harder pressure, but drier paper. So there are many ways of changing the shape and the size of the spots. I'm not very good at it. So, and I feel like I did it, I did it over a week from embodied knowledge. And I'm not a practicing Mokahanga artist. I generally make liner cuts. So I realized that there's a massive flaw in my experiment. The experiment is not very good. So, you know, I kind of need to give you all guys my parameters and have you do my <laughs> experiments for me. Because <laughs> you are all way more practiced than me. So I think, yeah, it's that it, there are very many other ways of um, I, I could make a recipe and I'm welcome to share my um, preliminary results with you if you're interested. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I think this is a very cool idea that Gomazuri actually means something. It's not an error, but it means something. And this is uh, some kind of very nice aspect of this lecture. Thank you. The historical uh, beginning was very nice, yeah, where the, the creative printmakers using that error from uh, the more professional uh, printmakers. Anyway, um, yeah. I'm going to... Uh... I, I say um, thank you for this, 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 we have such an indulgent and rich um, time for discussion. Um, this is so rare. Um, so Jennifer and Wanjin, um, thank you so much for your content, for your, your performance, for your images. Um, 
uh, for your directness um, about um, experiences and content that we don't um, necessarily articulate. Uh, um, there are a couple questions that have, uh, Linda Beeman has another question, um, but um, I, I do want to give um, the two speakers the opportunity to step out. Um, Linda, I'm, um, if you do wish to stick around and, and you know, we're in suspense now with Linda's question, um, do, but um, um, I can also, I'm happy to transmit the question um, in another way or link the two of you up, if, um, assuming um, it's uh, specific. To, I, to I just had a, a comment is all, not oh, a, oh, not go a ahead, question. Go ahead. And that was, um, I very much agree with Andrew and Paul that for many of us, it's an intuitive thing that we're doing. Um, I don't have formal training, so it's all been, how did I do that? I don't know, let's try it again. But I think the intent of the first Mokuhanga conference in 2011 was to try and capture this knowledge to pass it on to people. And, and what these two ladies presented was invaluable in keeping this art form alive. And whether this is how we work or not, I really appreciate their, their hard work and their time. And um, I may not ever look in a microscope I'm just going to wing it like I always do, but I really appreciate everybody's hard work. Well said, Linda. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, we have 20 minutes um, until we meet again for the next set of presentations. Um, I need, I do need to step away for a few minutes, um, but I will be back early. Um, what I, um, for those of you who just want to keep going and keep um, being connected, um, uh, why don't you keep your, let's see, how should we do this? Keep your screen, if you'd like to go into a breakout room or to pose um, other questions. Um, do so. Uh, I can toss out a couple of prompts for all of you um, where you might um, connect more broadly, um, but in the context of the of the um, presentation, what um, does anybody have it? You can you feel free to unmute and, and express your thoughts for this 20 minute window. So we have 20 minutes, we can just stay here. Uh, it seems like uh, the, Zoom, Zoom, yeah. Zoom, this Zoom is running for 30 hours. Um, so you can stay because here. It seems like a lot of people um, have stayed away. Right, I'm happy right. to well, this, this, is, this is the opportunity um, for it to get a bite to eat or take a break, which I'm, I'm going to do briefly. I will be back, but I will, um, I will go ahead and, and pose um, one question for those of you who might like to stick around and speak. And that is, um, the, the element of um, mistake. Um, there are so many points in this complex process where mistakes um, can happen. And just within you know, that minute field, of, well, it's not me, the massive field of, of SUMI itself. Um, but across the board, um, I wonder if it might be of interest um, to, um, to you who are remaining here for the next bit to discuss you know, what mistakes have turned into um, techniques for you. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, and I will be back soon. Um, thank you very, very much. What a, what a fabulous way to spend a, a weekday a morning in my case, um, more soon. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a question about did, did you do any research on the Nikawa that goes into the um, inks? I haven't. There is, there's actually a group in Japan that has formed, um, that is spending a lot of time and effort into researching traditional methods of making Nikawa and what all, and then doing the scientific work to see like, you know, all right, we say this, is that really what we mean? You know, or is that really what we find out in the long run? Um, and there's no topping them. So, oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you have any specific questions, I, unfortunately, I do not speak or read Japanese. 
So, you know, I have limits in what I can get from their information, but I've talked with them and taken a workshop with them. Um, So if you have questions about it, I can try and answer. Well, I'm, I'm always interested in the history of these things, how far back they go and the sort of religious and cultural significance of early forms of Sumi. Uh, it was developed in the eighth century, is that right? With the, with the Buddhist- It was brought over to Japan in the eighth century. Um, it had been being made in China and Korea for a long time before that. Um, uh, it, but it did, it came over, you're right, it came over with the uh, um, Buddhist monks, as with- um, A whole you know, cultural learning- nexus. As with writing Japanese, right? You know, the written language of Japanese paper. came over through Buddhism. Whole, right. And whole the, cultural. Monastery. And and at that time it was made with um, pine soot. Pine soot was predominant until I think fairly fairly recently when you think about the spread of the um, years you're talking about. For the past couple of centuries, I'm not sure what the proportion is, lamp black versus pine soot. Um, but I know in China, there's a book that says that in the Ming dynasty, um, 90% of ink that was made was made with pine soot. Um, and the I don't Ming think is that China. Would... excuse me, that's China. Uh, I, I don't it's... think it would be that different in Japan. Uh, now yeah. I would guess that it would be very different because finding people making pine soot the traditional way is extremely difficult in Japan. So it's more often uh, lamp black, mm-hmm. but commercially, yeah, I'm just remembering all the things you had in your talk. It was so dense, uh, but commercially they'll use um, coal. Carbon black, which is made, it can be made from anything. It can be made from, um, it's usually made in sort of oil fields um, or natural gas fields where they're burning off sort of excess whatever. And for artists, colors in common artist colors are always made from from that. Mm-hmm. So when we're talking about Japanese sumi, we're going back in time to a are they a finer grade of of uh, um, smaller particles, the the lamp black, and before that. Oh, the lamp black is finer than the pine soot. Mm-hmm. But the yeah, lamp black, black is black finer is than pine yet. soot. Um, and one of the things that I find personally fascinating is carbon black is made differently at every single factory and it is made depending on what its end use is. So carbon black made to go into car tires is made differently than carbon black that's made to go into printer toner, which is made differently than the black that's made to go into, you know, uh, some non-printer toner, but still blanking, you know, printers. Um, The history of Sumi ink is the history of cultural evolution across the world. Mm -hmm. The same way that Mokuhanga was preliminary to all the printing technology. Mm-hmm. that's been developed. Oh, so interesting. And I think that mod- a lot of modern sumi makers in Japan are not slavish to only using pine soot or only using lamp black in an ink, but rather are they, they are looking for the effects that you can get with the sumi. And so they'll combine what they need to of the pigments to get the effect they want. Um, whether it's, you know, more sort of thin flow or a different color tone or whatever. So I think oh, now well, it's- using, using liquid ink is so much easier for us who do mokuhanga. So yeah. that has to be a different formulation from the ink sticks. Yeah, I, I've been curious about that because I've been watching the demonstrations of people and I'm like, oh, everyone's using liquid. I should everyone's using know liquid. more about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Although there is a, a dense one, uh, it's like a almost like a paste uh, that's recommended for mokuhanga. I forget mm-hmm. uh, bokuju. Do you know one, John? It's called bokuju. Some... Bokuju. Has it it's been a, like a boiled down? 
And if you read the um, if you read the Seisendo leaflet, it says Bokuju is like specifically made for artists, and you can't let it dry out and then re suspend it. It won't be very good. So, uh huh, uh huh. It, but it that's tells... that's like halfway between the liquid sumi they use for painting and the sticks that you have to grind. Um, but I don't know how it's formulated differently. Um, yeah, I know when I've, I have um, a little bottle of liquid ink and it is very, very different than um, the inks that I've gotten from ink sticks, but mm -hmm. it was also given out for free at a museum exhibit. And so my guess is it's the cheapest form of liquid ink you could possibly get. Uh, um, so and Michelle, you may remember this. This was the, um, oh, I can't remember the Chinese book paper artist it was at the Sackler like 20 years ago. Um, yeah, now that uh, you're going on this, now I can't remember, but yeah, because I went to that exhibit. Um, yeah. Was it Chen Qi? So Chu Bing, Chu Bing. Chu Bing. Chu Bing. Oh, amazing so, artist. Mm -hmm. I just want to add, because I, I brush paint as well as print and uh, I don't mean to be so elementary, but the the ink is really, really dense. It's used when you brush paint mostly for calligraphy because in order to get any sort of gradient in it, you need to add a lot of water. And then that typically spreads on your paper because we use different paper to paint than I use to print. The ink stick, you can get a variety of gradations um, without adding a lot of water. So you can get a light gray to a medium gray to a almost black um, by grinding it and how long you grind it and how much water you add. So you're able to get kind of more of a variety of, of, of gradations, like I said, out of the ink stick that you can't get with the liquid ink. And that is what I've not been able to see is a difference that's up upon, upon quality for, for both, right? Not a a cheap ink stick to a expensive uh, ink, but kind of on quality both. That's basically, uh, we use ink uh, mostly for calligraphy. So in the Mokohanga world, if you want the black, as opposed to something that's gray, um, you would use the ink. There's also a lot of granular elements in the ink stick, because I was experimenting with the ink stick on um, a very porous wood and um, lots of bad things were happening <laughs> that I find amazing. So um, kind of happy accident. So anyway, I just want to kind of lend that to the discussion um, briefly. Well, the application of the ink doing woodcut, since you're not, you're applying it you don't have the same variety of tone that you do with a stroke that you do when you're applying it with a brushing it all over. So it's not necessary to have the same uh, gradated quality of that you get with ground ink stick. Agreed. That's probably why people in the printmaking world use the ink because they want the it's solid black. Already liquid ink, yeah. yeah. And then you yeah. get, to get the paler color, you add water on the block. Um, yeah, it's, it is a little different. Right. I'm going to be more careful about my Sumi ink in the future after all this discussion, though. Yeah. Me too. I now want to translate all my ink sticks to find out where they were made and, you know. Yeah. You know. Are hey. most of them made in Nara? I have no idea. There was a manufacturer in China who boasted that he in fact sold most of his ink sticks in Japan. Um, so it, it a lot uh, of stuff. the one thing I found when I was talking with people, again, I can't read, but I was having people translate. Unfortunately, um, most manufacturers don't necessarily have their name listed on the ink stick. And the inks are given like these wonderful romantic names, but you sort of have to decide Maybe, you know, like this one is referring to, you know, darkest forest ink. And so you think, well, that might mean pine soot. Um, 
and we have a collection of them in the conservation and scientific research department and trying to figure out what they all actually are is very tricky and who they came from was tricky because it wasn't always noted and it's not necessarily on the seller's information. Hmm. It sounds complicated a little bit the way Washi is complicated. It's hard to track that down and the names mm -hmm. are all over the place. Can I get in here a little bit? April? Oh, hi, George. Hi. <laughs> uh, you're talking about uh, liquid inks. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in our town, we have a store that sells Japanese paper and ink for calligraphy only. <laughs> uh, and there's like uh, maybe 50 or 60 different types of uh, sumi, uh, ranging in colors from browns wow. to purples. What, what town are you in? Where are you located? Akita, Akita in the north, northern part Akita? of Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, population is what, 30,000? And you can uh, get 500 <laughs> ink. You know how much sumi ink I can get here in Santa Cruz? Zero. Uh, <laughs> but, you, but you're talking about the liquid inks uh, in the, uh, what we would be like the dollar stores here, the, the Hakuen shop. The Hakuen shop uh, sells uh, 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 Bokju. Uh, and uh, if you read the label, and she was talking about the uh, the artists use more, that you can't let it dry. If you read the label, label it says that it has acrylic uh, polymer. Oh, really? <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm not sure what you're dealing with with some of the less expensive inks. Uh, actually, well, that's what Jennifer was saying. They're not well labeled. Actually, I uh, ever. Uh, for example, I make I make frames, a lot of my own frames, and I usually paint the inside black so that it won't reflect, and I usually just paint it with that. And it's once it's dry, it's stable. <laughs> that the, the dollar ink. <clears throat> uh, but uh, there are artists' inks and calligrapher ink that are uh, in uh, also Bokuju. They're not cheap, <laughs> but you can get them. I, I have some uh, about three different colors, a brown and a blue and a, a purple that I sometimes use. They're extremely dense and extremely nice to use. Uh, when you grind your own ink, it depends upon how long you grind it, and how fine it will get. So, you, you, uh, who, who, who was speaking just before saying the when grinding their ink and getting a terrible result could be from not grinding it enough. And uh, one other point, um, uh, uh, we have a, a, a we used to have a printmakers group here. Uh, there are only three people left living. <laughs> unfortunately, but the founder of this group that died about 20 years ago, uh, uh, used to collect uh, the uh, ground leftovers from calligraphy classes and then let it age. And the, uh, as it aged, it, the, ni the ni Nikawa would degenerate and you would get a very nice, very dense black for printmaking. And it would smell bad too, right? It would kind of rot. It would. The the, the, the sumi has a, a nice, a, a, a quite nice smell, and it doesn't get the bad smelling, as far as I can tell. The nikawa will deteriorate, but there's a lot of perfume in these. Yeah, in the, yeah. The the camphor is that what it is? I'm not sure exactly what it is. Hmm. Because when I studied with uh, Bill Payton, he would take those ink stick ends, put them in water and let it rot until it smelled. So the glue would be weaker. And mm -hmm. that was evidently better for printing. Yes, yes, yes. Because the, the ink is, the 
Mikawa in the ink stick is so strong mm -hmm. and it doesn't need to be so strong for, for printing Mokuhanga. <laughs> I don't know. I don't let it rot. I don't like the smell, but uh, I don't know. Uh, these old print, these old printers oh. just use this used ink. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I guess I have to take a break before we're going to start again in oh in five minutes. Five minutes. At 11 we start with more videos. Jennifer it's been great chatting with you just a little more. I really enjoyed your talk. Pretty fabulous. Thanks giving us all a lot to think about. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to go take a lunch break myself. Lovely to see everybody. Let's see. There's my I'm away and I'm off. <laughs> Yeah, I liked your question about um, mistakes as a way of developing ideas. And I think it's something that um, if my students or anything to go by goes really against the grain of Western teaching, that we're all um, outcome based and we have very little time to um, practice and to um, play around and experiment. Um, I was at Royal College where they kept um, telling us that it was very important to experiment and make mistakes. And yet we had these, <laughs> we had these crits that if you actually turned up with something that hadn't worked, you would just be lambasted for it. Um, so they were, didn't actually preach what they, uh, <laughs> um, so it's, I think it's a very difficult one. I think um, mistakes definitely are something you learn from, but they're not something they're very comfortable with. Right, right. I'm glad you raised that, Carol. I think that would be an interesting discussion. Um, and maybe after one of the, um, you know, one of the end of the day sessions, if people wanted to um, convene through an independent Zoom, which can easily be set up. I mean, I, I think particularly in, in traditions where you want to, um, you want to celebrate, you want to acknowledge, you want to master to, um, that tradition. At the same time, you know, if you do end up with with um, something that might, in, in a certain period of time, be um, designated as an error, somehow um, uh, it can be viewed differently. So, um, yeah, if if there's interest, um, I'd love to host um, a, a discussion of that later. I'm back um, here with all of you now um, to um, initiate the the afternoon um, in the in the America's time zone session of um, the conference. Um, I, for those of you who are new, um, I'm serving today as the moderator. Uh, my particular interest. Um, uh, not I have many interests, but my particular focus um, being on the social um, and cultural values of, of art, broadly speaking, particularly printmaking and handcraft um, in Asia. So that's where um, that's my my um, my love of, of the ideas. Um, but it's been in the years that I've been involved with IMC, it's been a pleasure to be um, involved and to hear from all of you. Um, so thank you for um, putting up with my face for um, another round of sessions. Um, 
We have two more back-to-back -back presentations as we did in the morning, um, and we will follow the same, um, the same approach. I'm going to send both of them out. In fact, I don't know what I'm waiting for. I'm gonna send them right now. Um, you have two YouTube links, which you, can, you should be able to click on directly to access those on Zoom, um, view those um, independently, um, which means um, most of you have your sound off, but go mute so that you can, um, you're not competing with the sounds um, here on Zoom. And then after 40 minutes time, um, we'll reconvene for question and answer, which I think is slightly shorter than the last period, but um, no, um, we, will, we will manage um, very nicely. And I noticed that um, our first speaker listed here, Helena Wright has just joined us. Um, welcome. Um, you there, there's a nice, <laughs> look like the disembodied hand there, but above your, above your name, but I'm very glad that you're with us today and what, um, what an opportunity that our worlds would um, overlap. Uh, Helena is, um, uh, has has for years and years um, served as a curator at the um, his, the Museum of American History at Smithsonian in Washington D.C. Um, and has worked um, in in all aspects of of um, of the visual, um, especially in printmaking, and. Um, she is um, going to relate a, a very rich story of the donation of the Tokuno collection, a print-related collection to Smithsonian. She's our first speaker, and then our second speaker will go, you know, on our, on our own view back to back, then Marco Leonos, Leonas, who's also, um, I was going to say, um, Washington, D.C., but he's actually with the Met. And let me just page through my Zoom here. Has he joined us? Is he with us? Um, he may be tuning in later for question and answer. In any event, Marco Leono is another chemist. So word is getting out that chemistry and Mokohanga um, have a synergy. Um, and he uh, will speak about um, synthetic um, dyes. So go ahead and uh, launch your um, YouTube sessions. And uh, 40 minutes later, we'll come back. And as before, um, type in questions as you like, as you're, if, um, it, as you're watching, if that's helpful. Uh, and then we'll have the, um, you know, the, the live questions um, afterwards. Okay, thank you. See you soon.